me. Hope uh, you can see the presentation. Uh, yes, we can. Yeah, cool. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, and uh, firstly, thank you for Dinesh uh, for also accepting this talk. Uh, definitely my privilege to be here. And uh, more than this talk, I'm also excited about the next talk, which is uh, going to be there by Vikram. Uh, so what is the motivation of this talk and who is it for? Uh, so I have been working nearly as for eight years as a software developer. And uh, we've all used databases. Uh, we've all used them heavily. We've used cache databases and memory databases, et cetera. Uh, but most of the times when we use libraries, uh, we don't get time to actually go into depth and see how it's implemented, like mostly with databases or any distributed library, any peer-to-peer -peer <laughs> network library. We don't get to go into depth and see how it is done, right? And that is where uh, our learning sort of lags. And that is where if you sort of uh, get into depth of particular tool, that's where you understand where it's useful, what are the kind of optimizations it supports, uh, where you can use it or not. Uh, so that is the motivation. Uh, it's for beginners uh, on how to build a simple key value data store in Go. Uh, so I'm going to keep this talk at a very general level, not to go into too much depth into code or anything else. So uh, if we want, we can you know connect later about that. Um, I'm working at VMware. Uh, I work as a platform engineer, mostly on Kubernetes, uh, building uh, operators uh, for our platform. So that's a short intro about me. Uh, so let's get into topic and motivation of why I built this, because as you know, there are already so many databases which are there, right? Uh, so I called my database FlashDB. The inspiration is that I want to make it fast. Uh, so it's an embeddable in-memory key value database in Go. <laughs> and it's completely based on how uh, Redis works. And I'll explain to you for those who don't know what Redis is in the upcoming slides. Uh, it's very curious on how to implement key value databases. I've uh, sort of implemented many. Uh, I just read papers and sort of keep implementing it, like uh, uh, the whiskey paper for Badger. Uh, then uh, you have Bitcask, et cetera. So I thought, like, uh, let's implement one for Redis and then uh, share it with the community. Uh, whatever learning it is, I just want to give a shout out. I've been hugely inspired by uh, React and uh, um, their knowledge sharing. Uh, React is a, one of the first distributed key value database stores, uh, and uh, they have shared a lot of uh, information on this topic. Um, so that is the curiosity. Uh, and one more part is that uh, there are a lot of uh, databases which we'll come to see, which are written in Go. Uh, but the problem is that uh, though you understand the architecture, but when you start reading it, it becomes very difficult. Uh, like if you take Level DB or some other databases, they are nearly 40,000 lines of code. And uh, even for <clears throat> an experienced developer, it takes a lot of time to actually go through and understand the so many files, so many packages, and how everything is linked, right? So an idea was that uh, to actually make a very simple database, less lines of code, and also very easy uh, and re, uh, easy to read. And also to dive into deep topics like how indexes work, how transactions work, what data structures are used uh, when a database is built, and how storage works. And uh, it is all for fun and learning. So first, uh, just a small primer on what an in, uh, in-memory store is. Um, so in-memory key value stores or databases are like purpose-built databases that rely primarily on memory for data storage. So they act like a cache on your machine itself. Uh, so they are fast. Um, they fit everything, most of things into RAM. And they have efficient data structures, which uh, concentrate on uh, storing memory in uh, RAM itself. They have simple mechanism. It's only a key value sort of a mechanism. There are no complex uh, data structures, uh, uh, very complex data structures involved. Um, because as you know, uh, when you're serving something from memory, if you're serving something from a cache, you want faster lookups, right? So the data structures focus on that in these databases. And yeah, minimal response times. One also important feature is that uh, though it's a key value database, some databases support different kind of values. And that is what we'll look at. So a few examples of uh, the various databases which you can find. Common one is Redis. You have Memcache. You have BadgerDB. Uh, you have LevelDB by Google. You have Bolt also by Google. RocksDB, currently managed by Facebook. 
Then HashiCorp has a very good uh, in-memory database uh, based on immutable radix trees called GoMemDB. And then uh, Josh Baker has a very interesting database called BunDB for uh, geospatial queries. Uh, just a shout out so that you can actually go and have a look at all these databases. I'm going to pick one database because I've used that uh, a lot. Try to explain to you what it is. Um, please uh, feel free to pause me if you uh, don't understand something or you want to correct me on something. Uh, so I'm going to start with Redis. I know most of you must have used Redis and most, some of you might have not. So Redis is this uh, defined as a remote dictionary server. So it's a fast in-memory key value store. Uh, a key value store, um, for those who don't know, you can just think of it like you're just storing a value against a key and how you store it in a map, a hash map. And um, you can think of Redis uh, like that or just faster version of it. It has multiple data structures uh, for supporting different kinds of values. And we'll come to that uh, in the coming slide on what different data structures Redis supports. Uh, it supports uh, intelligent caching, expiration of keys, eviction policies, pub subs, and there are different, different features which uh, Redis supports. <clears throat> so the key is a string, but the value can be a different type. So these are some of the values uh, which uh, value types which Redis supports. One is a string where it becomes like a simple key value string, where the key is also a string, the value is a string. It could be a hash table, it could be a linked list, it could be a set or it could be a sorted set. Now, uh, when I initially made this database and posted it on Reddit, uh, I had got this question that why do we need uh, so many data structures? Because there are people who come from a traditional database uh, background where they've used like MySQL uh, or SQL database for a long time. And uh, uh, the question was, why do we have different sort of uh, <coughs> data structures? So for that, I just want to uh, <coughs> showcase an example. <clears throat> so I used to work for a company, a startup called uh, Greedy Game, uh, and uh, what that company used to do, just to explain to you in an image, is that uh, you see this game, right? It's called WCC2. I'm not sure if many have played in India, but it's one of the biggest cricket games here. So uh, the interesting thing which you see here is, uh, you can see the big basket ad, right? Uh, so you can see how it's not coming as a pop-up, but it's in the game. So you can see it's on the grass, on the banners, et cetera. And I mean, you can actually configure it anywhere. So basically what we used to do was we used to provide an SDK uh, for game developers through which they can actually embed this ad in any game object. They can also embed this on the t-shirt or anywhere in the ground. And that's how this big basket ad is actually uh, displayed to you. So in the back end, uh, once a game starts, we go and uh, query different ad servers and find the best ad for a particular price and then serve it back into the game. And then that's how it works uh, in a gist. So I'm going to showcase a use case of Redis to you uh, in terms of, you know, uh, by creating some very simple example of an ad targeting platform. Uh, so you can see here, right? Like uh, in a game, uh, Big Basket would want to showcase an ad, Zomato, Swiggy, anyone else uh, might want to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an ad campaign. And uh, when a game request comes in for a particular location, from a particular location for a device uh, based on the game and OS version, we're going to see which ad campaign is suitable for this particular game. And that's an ad request, right, which comes from the game. So the first one, adding an ad campaign, how do you do it in Redis, right? So as we said, it's a key value store, but there are unique ways in which you can use Redis. Like for example, there's an ad which Shiggy wants to post uh, for Bangalore on the cricket game WCC2 and the payout is $2. So we can use a set here and we can see uh, the location colon Bangalore is the key. And then you add the campaign ID here for that Shiggy ad. Then you can create a key for game and uh, call it WCC2 and uh, add a campaign ID here. This is because uh, for this particular game, we can have many campaigns which we want to serve, right? And that's why it's a set and with multiple uh, uh, IDs. And then uh, about this campaign, we want to store like, uh, I mean, most of, data, most of the information is in database, but in a cache server, we want to store like relevant information, uh, least amount of information, which is required for serving on through your servers, right? So here we use something like an hash map where we say that uh, this is the ad, this is the ad ID, and then the attributes. We say the title is Swiggy, say T20 sale, 
the image URL is uh, something which uh, Sugi wants to post and some sort of information there. And then for a sorted set, we use uh, some a key which is called campaign payout. And then we say, what is the payout, which is two, and then add the ID against it. A sorted set is nothing but uh, a set where uh, you can uh, sort the ordering based on a particular rank or a value. So uh, here, based on the payout, I'm adding it uh, to this sorted set. So now how do you get an ad? So what you do is like, suppose a request comes in, what you do is you do a in set intersection, right? Basic command, you see uh, the location Bangalore, because if you see, we are storing campaign IDs against each key. So you take the location Bangalore and then you take what the game WCC2 and then you do a set intersection and then you get the Swiggy ad ID. Now let's say one more campaign ID is added, which is for Somato. Similar things happen. I'm not going to go through that. But if you see one thing you notice here is the payout, right? Which has increased. So now what happens is uh, when you try to get in campaign ID, when you do an intersection now, like you will get two IDs which are available for this game from Bangalore location, which is Swiggy and Zomato. But now you want to serve uh, an ad which has the highest payout, right? Um, so what you do is uh, you take a sorted set and then you create an intersection with this uh, uh, bunch of campaign IDs which you've got. And then what you do is that uh, you sort it based on uh, the payout which you've received. And I think you can uh, pop out the first element and then we can serve that as the campaign. <laughs> So the reason uh, why I've explained all of this is just to give you an example of why different data structures are there and how they are used in uh, like a key value database like Redis. Uh, so how different data structures are useful. So the idea is here to actually just mimic Redis and uh, try to make it in Go. So that is uh, what uh, I've tried to do here. So let's go into the dataverse, right? Let's see how exactly a database is made. Um, so what goes actually into building a database? It's pretty simple. The first thing that you have is storage. You have an immutable storage. And what I mean by storage is that uh, uh, if everything is in memory and uh, suppose a uh, computer restarts or uh, there is a server, uh, your program fails, everything will go away from memory, right? And you want to persist it somewhere. Um, so that is what storage is. You just uh, type down that what all commands have uh, that have uh, been executed so that uh, on reload of your program, you can reload the cache from this persistent memory. So that's what you, uh, the storage is here, which is like an append only log. And then you have the data structures which you want to execute, right? Like we had a set, sorted set, we had a hash map, et cetera. And that is the main logic of your database, what it'll do in memory, right? How it'll store things. <clears throat> and this is the storage layer. The next thing that you have are transactions. If you want to support asset transactions, you create a transaction layer on top of this. And then finally comes your API. Your API is like the public methods that you want to expose uh, to the outside world so that they can use it, right? Uh, in form of Go, you can, these are public methods which you would expose to anyone uh, so you can call particular functions. So this becomes the part of user API and that is it, or database, right? It has these simple components and uh, yeah. So let's actually get into depth of uh, first the data structures layer on how uh, various uh, of these stores uh, can be implemented because you need to understand that uh, because Redis has so many different stores, like it has a string as a value, it has uh, a sorted set as a value, um, hash map as a value. So there are different, different stores, which are there. stores as in different data structures to handle these different type of values. So what are data structures, which are there? So for strings, uh, they are like uh, two common uh, data structures, which I kind of looked into one was the suffix array where uh, you sort uh, like uh, your uh, the word which comes in by the suffix you create a suffix array and then according to that you search uh, it's helpful but it's not very scalable because at the end of the day it again comes down to uh, using an array and uh, when if suppose you have a lot of insertions then uh, it's like complete rebalance and uh, also like for prefix searches, it becomes more of a login operation because now here, what you're doing is uh, you have to do a binary search. If suppose you want to find uh, something that starts at A, what you do is uh, you go through this uh, array and do a binary search till the, the value is, uh, I mean, till you find the value or the key which uh, you're looking for. 
The other data structure which I looked into was a radix tri or try in general. Uh, most of you must be aware of uh, how a try works. Uh, and uh, uh, no try are good, uh, tries are also bad because they're not very memory efficient. So, uh, but one good thing about radix try is that it uh, helps you get do prefix searches uh, pretty easily. And uh, that is required in like uh, certain databases, right? You want to search keys starting with uh, certain values, starting with a certain prefix. And tries are useful for that. Uh, so there are different, different tries. Radix try is like an optimized uh, try. You have uh, the Patricia tries, which is also an optimized Radix try. I've used a particular version of try, which is called uh, adaptive Radix tries. It tries to uh, make uh, the Radix try more memory efficient. Uh, on details of that, uh, we'll go into later because I don't want to make it uh, very technical right now. And also I've linked papers here below in just in case you want to refer to uh, each of the structures which have been used and what's the reasoning behind it. A list, you can simply um, use a doubly linked list because it'll help you go forward and backward. Like if you want to have a query that uh, you want to have some sort of uh, values between uh, index zero and five. Mm, if you want to have some queries like that, in that case, a doubly linked list is used. So if you want to implement a list, it's just a simple uh, W linked list. If you want to implement a set, it's simple hash map um, because set stores unique set of values, right? And you can do that through a hash map. But when it comes to hash maps, uh, there were two uh, different uh, sort of things which I looked into. One was like direct implementation of hash map is using the inbuilt uh, Golang maps. Uh, Golang map, maps are efficient. You can, uh, if you want to create like multi-level uh, maps, where, for example, a key of key of value, something like that. You just create a map of map of uh, key, uh, I mean, strings, right? But uh, Golang maps uh, also uh, do not scale very well when you have like high insertions uh, and, uh, you know, uh, high rates. And there are different, different uh, ways in which different languages have internally uh, implemented uh, the hash map data structures. One of them is uh, hashed array map try. Uh, though I'm not implemented this and looking to implement this, but I just wanted to put it out so that uh, it works as research. But currently, hash maps are just implemented like uh, using Golang maps. <laughs> and lastly, comes the topic of sorted sets. And as we saw in sorted set, we were just co uh, storing two different values based on the rank which you provide, right? Like in case of those two different campaign IDs, we were sorting it based on the payout value. So sorted sets are implemented using a data structure called skip list. Skip list is like, uh, you can consider it like a simple, uh, it's a probabilistic data structure in the sense that uh, all your values are stored at node, but on each level you have uh, like uh, less number of keys uh, uh, stored so that you can uh, guess kind of like a little bit like a B tree that you say that, okay, on the top level is 30. So if you're searching for 30, you find it here. But if you're searching for 35, then you go to the next level. And then you check it's between 30 and 50. Then you come down to the other last, I mean, second last level and then last level. And then you try to find if you're trying to find 40. So it just creates some multiple levels on top for you to search easily. Uh, and uh, that is what a skip list is. So that is what goes into the data structures part. Now let's come to storage part because we want some durability uh, so we don't lose data on uh, restarts. Uh, there are two ways in which uh, uh, storage is done currently. Uh, one is like you have a simple file append where uh, suppose uh, uh, I'm writing all these commands and these are commands that are being executed on uh, uh, the database. You can just store the simple command uh, in an append only log, right? You can just keep on appending whatever commands are there. And this is how Redis also does it. It keeps on appending to an append log uh, all the commands which are being executed so that it can read easily from this log on database restarts. Obviously, there are pros and cons, but we want to keep it simple here. This is an append only log, and some widely used structures right now are called LSM trees. Uh, won't go into depth into that, but uh, it's a placeholder, so we can discuss it uh, later. Uh, so what, how is the append only lock uh, implemented right now? It's just like appending records to a file. So it's like an immutable log right now where you can just append records to the file. 
and uh, you can specify what's the length of the file. So here I've given an example, like if you say that uh, I can only store three records in a file, then automatically it will create a new uh, log uh, files, for you, like log.1, log.2, log.3. Uh, and what happens is that suppose uh, you're restarting a database, uh, on restart what happens is the database goes through all these log files and executes each of these commands uh, one by one, and that's how it gets loaded back into memory. So that's how storage is implemented. A simple write to a file. And uh, we definitely don't just write commands because that is like uh, uh, not an efficient way of writing. So this is like the keys, uh, how we how I'm encoding it and then writing it actually to the file. So the storage format is uh, something like this, that uh, you have the key size for uh, first, which is like in, uh, uh, in 32, then you have uh, like the member size, member size in like is in, if you have a hash map, you have the parent key, then you have the child key and then you have the value, right? Uh, so for that, you have something called the member size, then you have the value size, then you have uh, something called the state, uh, the timestamp at which it was created, and then you have the key value, the key member value stored as bytes. This is how the information is encoded. The state is used to say what exact type of command it is, and uh, for which uh, uh, sort of store it is used for. Uh, so that is uh, what information is stored in state. Like if you're using a hash map, then it was a hash map command. If you're using a sorted set, it was a sort, sorted set command. So this is how the encoding is done. Oh, you can simply store it like uh, plain text also, but encoding just helps you in uh, uh, constructing the information. And uh, that is why it's there. And then finally, we come to a transaction layer. Uh, it's very curious on how transactions are implemented in databases, right? Uh, because we've heard a lot about transactions, but uh, on database level, how exactly they're executed. And uh, this is where I took my inspiration from is uh, a database called BundDB and uh, had a very simplistic way of actually implementing a transaction. Uh, so in the gist, what transaction is that you start a particular function, you take in a bunch of queries which you want to execute. And then what you do is that uh, you commit it. And if everything goes uh, uh, smoothly, you commit a transaction. If something wrong happens, even in one of those queries, what you do is that you roll back, right? It's a simple process, which we have all heard about. Implementation wise also is very simple. Here, maybe I'll have a little bit of go code here. A transaction is implemented simply just using three values. The database, underlying database, which you want. Uh, is it a read uh, or transaction or a write transaction? or uh, you know and what is the right context we just store the information about what all uh sort of queries we want to execute right so these all queries which are here are appended to this uh, right context so you can see that uh, whatever transaction which i want to execute like uh, doing a get or a set or whatever it is is appended to this particular transaction as a record So now when a transaction begins, uh, the logic is pretty simple. You take a lock uh, because currently uh, in FlashDB I've implemented that uh, you can have only one write transaction at a time and multiple reads. So that is the reason you take a lock first and then you see if it's a writable transaction and then you return back that transaction struct. Once you've returned back the transaction struct, what happens is then people can go and add any function to it. Like they want to read <coughs> or they want to write or uh, uh, how it is. Uh, let me show you an example of actually how this looks on the library itself. <coughs> so if you see here, uh, if I want to say, uh, do a read transaction uh, or a read transaction, right? What I do is I pass in a function um which uh, accepts the whole transaction struct and then you pass you do whatever you want inside it do a get and then a set whatever you can you want to do you can do it inside a, a function right so you have you are supporting two type of transactions here one is the update one is the view in update you can actually uh write to the database in view you can just read many things and once you have read it you can i mean the view db.view just allows you to do a, a read only transaction so that's why you have this function here the function is executed. And if you see here, this is the main part about how a transaction is executed, right? You begin the transaction, 
if there is any error, uh, you roll back and then you commit the transaction. And uh, again, if any error roll back, you execute the function, very simple steps. Uh, and I mean, in it's like very small piece of code in which you can just see how a transaction could be implemented. <laughs> Committing a transaction is easy. Whatever was in your right context, you just encode it. Like uh, I showed you the encode format, what was there for each of the record which came in, and then you just write to the uh, append only log. And uh, that's what happens in a commit. If any error happens when you're writing to a log, et cetera, error is returned, and then you can roll back. And then finally, you have the API methods, which are the public methods which I expose to people. Like they want to add to a set, then you expose the yes add method, or you have like you want to set into a map, uh, you can have a head set method. And these are the final uh, pieces in the jigsaw puzzle of exposing public methods. I think I jumbled up a little bit there. So, yeah. So, if you see here, the idea again was to make like pluggable libraries, which are very easy to understand and use. And, uh, you know, if you take this as an educational DP, you can just sort of poke it and uh, just plug and play. Uh, there are some interfaces which each store satisfies, just satisfy those interfaces like get, set, delete methods, and then implement whichever data structure you want. Like these are the pluggable libraries which are there. Uh, you have uh, for a radix tree, uh, there's an art library for a sorted set, etc. Even if you write your own library for tomorrow, if you want to implement a hashed array, map try, or any other fancy uh, height ordered or uh, radix try or anything as uh, such, you can just satisfy three interface methods, which is get, set, delete, and then you can actually plug it into a database and then use. So with that, uh, I'll just show a simple demo of how actually this works. So I've written a simple CLI. What it does is that uh, it just uh, runs uh, Flash DB currently uh, as a server. So uh, simple command, let's say, I'm going to set set foo to bar, right? And then I'm going to issue a command called foo to get it. I get the value which is there. You can also expire the value. You can say expire foo in five seconds. And then when you get the value, you'll be able to access it. But after five seconds, there is a background uh, GC kind of uh, process, garbage collector, which uh, clears the expired keys. So you see after five seconds, that key is not there. So there's a simple CLI also, if you want to play around, it's very similar to how Redis CLI uh, is implemented. It is implemented using a library by Josh Baker called Redcon. I'll add it. Uh, in uh, the presentation so you can have a look um so that is it um i love to take questions I just want to keep it simple and uh, yeah okay i have a question could you walk us through transaction.begin commit yeah so uh that, that's pretty cool uh Ron. I, I, I think there are more questions from the top like like i was more curious okay. in the code like some more deep level, right, uh, right, right. people can sort of shoot questions directly and then you can uh, uh, discuss those questions. Uh, the first question is from Sendil. Hey, you want to shoot it? Right. Yeah, uh, so it's the main purpose of append only logs to support point in time recovery. Uh, yes, but also uh, in this database, I want to support durability that uh, all the records, all the write and uh, expire records are written uh, to a file so that on restart, you can actually uh, recreate the cache back. So that is the only purpose of an append only log. So what happens is that uh, when you restart the server, it will go through all the uh, log files and then it will read it and then rebuild the cache. Uh, instead of uh, transaction.db being a pointer to flash db, could that also be an interface to flash, which is concrete implementation? Uh, the reason why uh, transaction is a pointer uh, and not an interface is because, I mean, you can implement as an interface, but uh, the idea is that they are different, different stores and they are different, different uh, uh, like uh, APIs which have exposed, right? For a hash map, there are like multiple functions which are there. Uh, just to give an example here. Uh, you can see for hash map, there are multiple functions for a set, there are different functions, etc. So, uh, I mean, even if you pass it as an interface internally, you'll have to pass it as a pointer for that transaction to get committed, right? 
So if you want to mock it, definitely you can use an interface and then satisfy all the metrics which have been exposed uh, throughout. But yeah, you can definitely do that. How about not using timestamp and using an offset, something like Lampert clock uh, if distributed to get to know about the order of the commands in case we need to push to resolve conflicts. Uh, definitely Lampert clocks are used in distributed system, um, right? Because uh, there's uh, no concept of a uh, real time clock there, like system clock is not there. So you face either on logical clocks or Lampert clocks, right? But here it's in, uh, it's, the database is currently designed to run on a single machine itself. Um, so that is the reason uh, uh, timestamps uh, have been added just to check if, uh, you know, just to add that information about when uh, this record was created. Also, since uh, I'm currently only supporting one, like uh, you can have one write transaction and multiple reads. So that way the ordering still gets uh, preserved in the log. It's a single node DB for now, but the idea is that even if uh, uh, I'm sort of looking to implement, like, uh, as I said, right, it's, you can, I mean, it's like in development DB, which I want to take where I can experiment with things. And that's the purpose of it. It's not like uh, you can use uh, something in production, et cetera. Uh, but it's a development DB for anyone to get started with. And uh, if you want to implement like a peer-to-peer -peer networking library on top of it, it has to be like a pluggable, plugin which comes in and does all that information. So yes, I'm working on it, but uh, to make it multi-node, but uh, anyone can actually uh, do that. Could you talk us through transaction.begin? Okay, cool. Uh, let me think. Right, Dinesh. Uh, Hello. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I was more curious on like I mean used uh, the interface of databases like set in and all of that. Uh, but mm -hmm. while reading up also like with Redis, like even to do the log, like we have to use the uh, uh, like underlying level logs and stuff like that. So even transaction begin and commit, like how does it get implemented? Maybe a set or get uh, like how do you deal with concurrency? And then how 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 does it translate it in terms of code? Because it's not it's can't be just a simple fetch from uh, a store, right? So there's much more going on, right? So th that's why we're right, about, uh, yeah. Right. So if you see here uh, in the transaction struct, which we're creating, there's a lock, right? Uh, there's a mutex lock. Um, sorry, oh, where did I show it? Yeah. So on the database itself, uh, which is the flash DB struct, right? I've added a particular lock, uh, that's a mutex lock. So through that, I'm guaranteeing that uh, we can execute only one write transaction at a time, but you can have multiple reads. So with that, what happens is that when I begin a transaction, I first take the log. And uh, once the transaction is committed, then the transaction or the rollback is done, that log is released. So through this way, because uh, I mean, it's an opinionated framework in which you're seeing that only one writes are allowed at a time uh, and uh, non multiple writes are allowed. So even if two writes come in, uh, unless that lock is released, uh, will not happen. Uh, so that is how it is currently done. Uh, there are no sort of lock free data structures, which are implemented currently to handle the concurrency case. Uh, but, but in usual cases, we would be seeing right. like multiple transactions, uh, right? Like, like, even if not for this code, like, could you sort of share how mm -hmm. it's sort of handled there? Because, because obviously there'll be multiple kind of inserts like there we are locking on tables or rows that kind of right? so how do you translate that uh, to this here right uh, the different ways which i have seen like sometimes people also take a file lock when they're writing to a particular file like a transaction when they're writing to a particular file right uh, so what they do is they take a file lock and then uh, on top of that uh, they keep on uh, appending it uh, so that uh, i mean this i'm talking on the storage layer and uh, uh, on data structures layer, uh, I mean, from the ones which I've explored, uh, like uh, lock free data structures. If someone else also has uh, any idea on this, uh, you can talk about. I can't think of currently, uh, but uh, that is what I've seen, like in Prometheus or uh, uh, in uh, 
different databases. They take a file lock when they're permitting a transaction. I mean, not Prometheus doesn't have a transaction as such. So, and it doesn't require locks, right? Prometheus because it's just append on the time series uh, database. But uh, most of the databases which have uh, implemented transactions, somewhere there's a file lock or there is lock on database level itself. So that is what I'm aware of. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, we can take this offline. Like we can discuss yeah, 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 later. Yeah. I'm, I'm sort of curious on much more uh, internals, but yeah, like we'll take yeah, it yeah, later. Definitely, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, because we have five minutes, I don't take time from Vikram's talk. Also, if a right action gets stuck, does it time out? Uh, so, uh, what happens here is that uh, here, if you see, there is a right which is happening currently. Uh, the only right which is happening is to actually write it to uh, the file, right? So there is uh, usually uh, it's being handled to the OS level to actually commit the file, but uh, so there's no requirement of uh, a timeout here as such. But if you were making a network call and anything as such, yes, definitely can put a timeout, but currently it's not implemented. But if any error occurs, uh, we roll back immediately. If you can see here, the rollback function is called and that is how the locks are currently released. Uh, you can also check in various test cases uh, on, you know, the concurrent test cases which have been written on uh, how it's handled. What is the CLI framework? Uh, so uh, if it's not a CLI framework, it's actually a, how do you implement like a Redis, like a server or uh, uh, it's this library called uh, redcon you can create a redis compatible server for go so that uh, for example if you want to uh, create uh, like uh, the set of functions and without even executing something in the back end you just want to create a set function by using a hash map etc all you can do is uh, you can uh, uh, use this library and it will uh, you can just use switch statement and then for each of your commands, you can just write out uh, what exact uh, output it has to give. And I think Redis has a, a particular, uh, forgot, uh, it's, is it if it's called uh, Redcon or way in which you can actually, I mean, it's like a, a format in which you can actually write commands and then uh, uh, read input and then write output. So Redis CLA follows that. And I think Red, Redcon is actually implemented in that. So what I've done is that I've just taken this redcon library, created an instance of flash TV, and then for each of uh, uh, like uh, the commands you were seeing on the CLI, right? Like get set, etc. I'm just calling that flash TV function. So that's how it's happening. Yeah, Ripple. Yeah, thank you, Shan. Uh, there's one more question by Pavan. Uh, what are the factors for writing this in Go? Oh, uh, because uh, I have used Go for a long time. It's pretty easy to get started with, and uh, most importantly, it's a little easier to read also. Uh, and that is the main reason for uh, writing it in Go. Uh, if you see here, there's not like uh, many places where Go routines are used, except for one place, which is uh, the eviction mechanism. So what we do is that uh, we run a go routine uh, so that uh, for each of the stores, which are there, like a string store, a hash store, et cetera, it will keep on periodically doing a GC uh, to uh, delete the expired keys because you have expiry support also on this database. Uh, so that is where go routines are used. Apart from that, the type language is easy. That's why I've used it instead of writing in something like Rust. I'd be happy to uh, take your questions after this talk also or in the chat. Uh, I'd just like to give control over to Vikram right now. Hey, Farhan. Uh, thanks for that great talk. And I love your slides. I need to learn how to make my slides look that nice. <laughs> Thank you. Look forward to your talk. Uh, some background about me. I. Uh, I've mostly worked on building startups uh, apart from uh, a relatively long stint at LinkedIn, uh, where I worked on um, various things, but primarily on ad serving engines. So, you know, the, some of the data infrastructure and stuff needed with uh, uh, ad indexes and stuff. So, you know, some of Farhan was talking is relevant. Uh, 
uh, when you mentioned about ads. Um, yeah, and um, since then I've been uh, working on a couple of startups. One of the current one that I'm focused on is called 42 Papers. It is, uh, it's like a platform for getting more people to read research papers. Uh, you know, going back to Franz Dorf, he did mention that he likes to read papers. So, you know, and, uh, and what we want to do is basically try to get more, this is not focused on academia, it's focused on everyone else. And, um, you know, I, you know, if I get my mom to read scientific papers, then I've succeeded, but that's a very long goal. Uh, so yeah, so we're basically focused on trying to make papers more accessible, surfacing interesting papers, you know, finding, helping you find other people who have similar interests in similar areas of research or, you know, and primarily we're focused on like computer science and AI kind of papers for now. Uh, but there's a long tail of all kinds of stuff. So. Um, this project I want to talk about today is called Grafgen. It's uh, it's not a startup. It's not I we do I do build I run my startup on it, but it's not by itself. A, it's just a pure open source project that um, is mostly a labor of love and uh, also of my understanding of um, you know my experience in like building web apps primarily um, over the years. So uh, you, you know uh, at least in the front end world, um, one pattern is really common. I'm sure you know in the dev world generally. I'm sure, you know, there's a one team working on like mobile or React uh, front ends, web front ends, whatever. And uh, there's another team working on like the APIs in the back end. And, and usually the most common pattern is the web, uh, the front end people are waiting on you to build some kind of an API or uh, they are waiting on you to change an API. You know, that's a very common pattern. Um, or even if you're the same guy, you're working on both, then you know this is context switch where you have to like leave React world and then move to Go or Ruby or whatever, and then you know Python and then make those changes and then switch back. Additionally, there is also you know this uh, secondary context switch where you might have to go into an ORM or like an SQL, yeah, uh, and you know again because people don't want that context switch, they stick to ORMs, which are you know not always very efficient. Uh, and then you, you know, say you're writing SQL, then it's like a third context. So it's it's not an efficient way to, at least I believe that it's not an efficient way to work. There are too many disjoint parts here. Um, and, and often, you know, we see issues like uh, N plus one queries and stuff where people are just, you know, saying, let's get this done. It doesn't matter if you fire like, you know, whatever number of database queries. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to kind of solve that. And um, and especially when I'm trying to build a startup building myself, I, I hated this context switch and stuff. And, um, and I, was I was looking around for a solution and I did not find anything out there. There was no way to just ask for some data in your web app or your mobile app and just get it. Um, but then I kind of stumbled into GraphQL and uh, after spending many years on REST and I, you know, I, I, I used it, but I didn't ever like it because REST always had this weird thing where you're trying to fit a view that you need to render into this like resource. And then you have to deal with all the HTTP. It's like, it feels too low level. And also it feels inflexible because you're like, you have products and then you're like trying to figure out is this slash user ID slash products slash product ID or is it just product ID? And then we fetch, you know, it's, it doesn't always map to these views and we build these view specific ones. And you know, it's, it's I've never found it to be fun. So, um, I then stumbled into GraphQL and yes, it had this promise where, you know, you could ask for the data you want and you get it. Um, to me, that was an interesting idea. At the same time, I understand databases and indexes and stuff. So you can't just ask for anything, right? I mean, that doesn't make sense. So, um, and also another thing is I'm kind of lazy. So I didn't want to like sit and like rebuild everything in this, like and relearn GraphQL and this whole thing. And when I started digging into GraphQL, there was a lot of new stuff. There were these loaders and, and there were resolvers and this, this whole world of stuff that you have to like kind of piece together. And that didn't interest me at all. So, um, so you know, in, compared to that, yeah, REST seems simple, you know, just an HTTP endpoint. So I wanted to find something in between. And then I realized that, yeah, you know what, if I could take this GraphQL, which is, you know, if you squint at it, right, it just looks almost like JSON. And you, um, um, sorry, I'm not screen sharing as yet, but let me just do that. Okay, so I um, so I decided to approach it like a compiler problem because I had worked on you know internal DSL compilers and stuff in the ads uh, team. We had you know compilers for various things internally, um, and uh, so I realized that if I could like gather this knowledge about your database 
and then use that knowledge to take this GraphQL query and write it out into an efficient SQL query, then it would be almost magical, right? Because it's it's like, oh my God, can, you know, why did no one do this before kind of thing? And, um, and then I slowly kind of started working on that and it took a while, but um, you know, I think um, GraphGen is basically uh, the result of uh, you know a lot of experimentation, me learning more about like databases and Postgres and, and the capabilities, uh, and I have a newfound appreciation for these databases like Postgres. I you know I realize I can build so much in them without reaching for another you know infrastructure piece. Um, all right, so let me just get into it. So that's that's just a high level on my motivation on why I care about uh, GraphGen and why I built it and why you know you should care. Uh, you know, again, same thing, writing APIs, um, you, you know, the talk to databases is pretty much 90% of dev work you know, in terms of at least, um, you know, building product apps and stuff. So, um, and this is honest truth. Most, you know, even, you know, I would put myself in that bucket too some time ago. I mean, I wouldn't say I was proficient. I, I even met people who'd make uh, multiple database calls just to avoid a join. So, you know, and, and, the data is right there in the database. It's the most efficient C code to make that join. Instead, you know, they would rather have that data pulled all the way back to their app and then try to use a hash map or something in Ruby or a PHP or something, try to join it. And um, and then you know, have multiple joins, you know, forget that. You know, that's or it's I'm sorry, I understand why it's a context switch. It's like SQL isn't the nicest language to work in. And if you're working in this other paradigm, you don't want to suddenly move into this SQL world, right? Um, I know I'm a little generalizing here, but you know it's it's what I've come across, and which is again, OR the 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 prolification of ORMs kind of proves my point a bit. Uh, so, like you know, forty two papers is my site. I mean, it's it's quite a complex, heavy app. There's a lot that I'm fetching here. You know, I'm fetching all these images, I'm fetching pictures, I'm fetching the papers, I'm fetching all the related people related to the papers, I'm fetching all the social information around each of those papers, including the information of each person who engaged with the paper. And there's, there's a lot. And, uh, and essentially, um, I, you know, I wanted to fetch all of this with one request. Yeah. Um, so GraphQL essentially, GraphGen is designed to give front-end more focus, uh, more power. So essentially as you're developing a front-end app, could be a mobile or desktop app, you should just be able to write the GraphQL query you need and um, an introduction that query should just you know basically deliver data to you in both. At the same time it has to be secure. So you don't want to be, you don't want clients to be able to issue any kind of query against your you know infrastructure and get whatever they want back. So um, for example, like building a blog, right? I mean, there's a lot of APIs you have to build. Just you know, blog is a simple example. Most people will be like, you know, right. But you know, you're fetching posts, you're fetching votes and posts, authors, comments on authors. You having you know like um, yeah you're uh, let me just see then you might have an admin thing you might have uh, you know like more APIs around comments and it just goes on there are a lot of APIs and building and maintaining all of that can be quite complex it's like and I know we've been doing it forever right what if those APIs you didn't have to build and maintain them you just issued a query. And that query got um, and that query got cached in the server side uh, during your dev phase, and the server knew that this is a query that's valid. This is something you need. And in production, that's you know those set of queries that you issued in dev were the only ones allowed to be executed. So essentially, this is not a GraphQL API where you can ask for whatever you want or you know change the API anyhow. Think of it more as a way of generating APIs. You know. You're, you're writing out the GraphQL that you need in a dev directly into your client that's making those requests. And uh, that in production now gets compiled into SQL. I mean, even in dev, so sure. But in production, that's the only one that's compiled into SQL as prepared statements in the database and executed. Uh, an another thing that happens with uh, GraphGen is you can have these complex nested queries, right? Because you can ask for, say, a user or a, a post, and then you can ask for all the people who commented on the post, and you can ask for um, all the user in information about each of those people. Then maybe there are people who like the comments, who like the post, you want their information. You might have some other things like the images that come with the post, and you know, there just so much. And what if you could fetch that with um, in one like query, 
essentially. Um, so what GraphQL does is um, it takes all of that GraphQL and compiles it into a single query. So even if it's nested, like you're asking for, or you're, you know, you say you're asking for, let's look at this query on the left. So you're asking for a user. This is like the logged in user calling it me or whatever. Then you're asking for a thread of say posts. And then you want the slug of the thread, the title, were published, you know, you want some information about who voted on it, the topics, the author, the post, several things. That's quite a complex API to build, right? Several joins, lots of uh, like stuff to remember and keep in mind, you only you know how many 50 to fetch. And, and additionally, you might want to paginate. So what if you have like 10 and then you want to fetch the next 10 and build the you know, next 10 and build. So you have to have all of that. What if this query could just do all of that? And uh, that's all you have to do. If you define the data you need, it gets compiled into um, a single, again, like I said, a single SQL query. So, you know, even though it's fetching, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 tables, it does the joins, it uses, it generates a JSON, it does everything for you. you what you get back is exact JSON structure that you were expecting. Um, additionally, it has support for things like uh, cursor pagination. So it would send back a cursor, which is encoded. So you just pass that back and say, okay, give me the next step. It gives you a new cursor, you pass that back, say, give me the next step. So you can essentially build like, you know, a pagination, infinite scroll or whatever. So the fact is now building your API is just a matter of writing out that JSON, uh, the, sorry, the GraphQL, that's it. And in the backend, it does a lot for you. Firstly, when it's doing the joins, it understands indexes. So it does the most efficient joins for you. It uses a single query. So no matter, you know, so again, the performance is way better because, you know, you're not making 20 queries to the database anymore. Um, everything is, uh, and as, as GraphGen becomes better and as more Postgres, you know, it kind of evolves with say Postgres or MySQL's new features. You, those features are automatically available to you and part of your compile step, uh, you know, when you upgrade GraphGen, you know, so essentially your SQL is getting better. Uh, the API is also like, it's one API. It's designed with security in mind. It, it handles authentication. It has compression built in. It handles, uh, you know, key tags and cache headers. And so you're not rebuilding an API. Essentially, this is, this is the API and it's getting better and better and better. It has tracing capabilities, and everything built in. So uh, it has even more advanced uh, GraphQL features like subscription. So if you say I want a WebSocket to auto-update Send, you know, have information about new comments that got added somewhere else, you know, on the same post by someone else, I'm sorry. Uh, you can subscribe, you can say, okay, give me, you know, some, something like new words or something by this customer. And, and essentially, GraphGen will is smart. It, will, it efficiently combines these subscriptions together and issues only one query against your database in the backend. And it tracks that. And when the result is different, then it knows, you know, let me inform all these web, web socket clients that there was a change and this is the new new data so you know like and uh, it knows how to like group these things and everything efficiently so essentially you can build some kind of a real-time updating product with uh, uh you know with very little load on your database yes it has to use gra uh, polling but again it's like one query or you know 10 queries as opposed to hundreds of thousands you know. so mm -hmm. And uh, there are lots of capabilities that Postgres has, like Postgres can handle uh, and MySQL as well, full text search, um, you know, has polymorphic relationships. It has <coughs> ability to do graph, I'm sorry, excuse me. It has the ability to do graph, um, um, what do you call those things? And nested queries, like almost graph traverses. Like that is SQL that most people don't even know how to go, you know, it's around, it's quite deep SQL stuff. And, and the fact that the compiler already knows that, it can make that available to you. So you say, give me comments and give me the comments on the comments. And then it would give you this kind of nested, um, you know, it would walk this graph thing using a, what they call a recursive CT. And uh, it's, it's written in Go, it's available as a standalone service, you know, that comes with everything around this. So it's the core of GraphGen is the compiler, but around it as a service, it has, you know, efficient APIs, compressions, authentication module to handle JWTs. And, um, you know, it can even handle the Rails cookie. So if you send it a Rails cookie, it can decode that and take out the user ID and use that in the queries. Uh, it does the same with JWT tokens. It has uh, several features like you can 
actually have scripting. So you can have JavaScript functions that get executed as part of your GraphQL query um, to, to do things like, you know, add business logic or whatever. It can, um, it can do remote joins. It's a really cool feature where you have a different API in the back end of five APIs and say, say you want to fetch a user from the database and a whole bunch of stuff, but you want to, uh, you want to fetch a Stripe subscription information from Stripe. Then you can actually have that um, same query do the you know pull that data from Stripe and join it as part of this result. Um, it's it's uh, you know it's it's a uh, you know it's a relatively interesting project and uh, it's it's growing. There is um, you know a bunch of people now. I think it's closing under two K stars and um, it's taken a while though. And uh, there are people contributing and. Um, and my motivation most of these talks is to get you know more people uh, excited and to you know try try to um, you know who are who want to kind of deep dive into a project that is you know it's coded to be easy for other people to get in and motivate you know like uh, one of my motivations with uh, you know the Farhanos mentioned you know it's easy to read uh, Go like yes performance and the fact that I enjoy writing Go and all that you know it has mature libraries so, you know I love the fact that there's backward compatibility guarantees. I love all of that, but the fact that it's easy for people to jump in and change and, and add code and read code is like reading code is almost uh, more important than writing code. So, um, and uh, you know, it comes with this um, and it's also easy to change. It has an extensive test suite that is uh, runs end-to-end -end testing. So it starts up Postgres automatically in the back end, and it, you know, runs a series of tests against it. But, um, all of that, you know, in, in Go. Um, yeah, so that's, um, pretty much everything uh, in terms of the project. Let me show you a quick demo. So uh, this is a UI that's embedded as part of um, part of the part of CraftGen. In fact, it's like, you know, the Go has this new feature called embed, where you can actually embed uh, static, um, you know, any kind of data along with the GraphGen application, sorry, the Go application kind of gets embedded inside it. And I use that to embed a whole React app, which serves as the UI. Um, this is an example of a query. Um, say normally you, just, you know, when you want to save, have these queries saved, you actually give them names. So you can say, you know, get user or whatever, you know, you can, or, you know, get current user, I mean, whatever you want, right? I mean, these named queries, then what happens is allow this actually, there's, there are files created with all these queries within your config object, config uh, in your system. So you clearly know what kind of queries you are. You can even write a CI thing to you know look at those queries, see, oh, is credit card numbers leaking or whatever. Um, at the same time, GraphChain also has the capabilities. You can have block lists. You can say these columns can never be used in any query and stuff. So that way you get a level of protection that is at uh, at a higher level than you know app developers. So which is really great because you know if you want to like lock up password fields or certain other sensitive fields that can never be used by a developer. Uh, this is a simple query, a user, you know, ID three, just, you know, give me back his uh, information. Um, uh, let, let me make that more advanced. So maybe I'll say, okay, let's also get all his products that he is, he's kind of like, you know, associated with, maybe he's bought them, created them, and then um, we'll get the names of those products and maybe, uh, maybe the description and right there. So you get all of that. And that's, that's a single query just to kind of show you that in the back end. That, that those, that's the query. So that's actually SQL. I think there's some right there. So uh, I didn't copy it correctly, sorry. There. Okay. I think that these escape statements, that's why it's not formatting it. I, I need to clean it up, but essentially you can see what I'm saying. Um, you know, it has this, this UI has these capabilities to do more. You can even, um, literally go in and dig in, say, I say, in addition to product, say, I remove, say, I remove the description. I want to, um, let me see, I want to query, I want to, you know, get something else, like maybe comments on something and then, you know, the comment output, I can just, you know, get the category and then, you know, there's a whole bunch of documentation that I can use right here. Um, then there is the Explorer, which doesn't seem to be working for some reason. I need to debug that. 
Um, but you can essentially craft your queries here and then use them in your application. They are also added to the allow list. Uh, yeah, that's uh, you can pass variables. So you can use variables right here. I could do something like dollar ID, and then I could do uh, ID five. This is you know. So ID five, I could get his information. You know, he doesn't have any products, so you don't see any. Um, see empty array. I could uh, I could pass um, you know user. This is like headers or like JW. This is to simulate a user ID, and then I could just do you know dollar user ID and then you know there is no such user but say I say three or something so, so it's like a way to simulate a user being used um, well yeah that's that's pretty much it Let me switch back and take some questions okay so um, so the questions are um, trying to follow through the sense for on uh, Okay, yes, uh, I would say that it, it is very similar to Hasura, except it's in Go and, uh, you know, it started, I, you know, honestly, I didn't know about Hasura till, till some time back and, you know, um, it's also a great project. Uh, I looked into it with Haskell or something and I just, there's no way I was, you know, going to be able to contribute on to Haskell. So, uh, also I wanted something that could be a library because Go is, you know, growing ecosystem and, and, um, this, for example, is a whole library. So if you go in here and you go into APIs, um, you will see that it has like, this is an example. So like you can literally use it like an ORM. So you don't have, it's very efficient. You can essentially create a graph gen service. You can issue a query. So you don't have to use an ORM. You can actually just use this. It's, it gets compiled, um, lazy compiled very quickly. It's only a single compile that happens. So if you're issuing like 5,000 requests per second, it's not gonna compile every time. In production, it compiles only one, every query just once. And additionally, it compiles it as a prepared statement in the database. So your parameters go directly to the database. There is no compiling, no parsing. So it's very fast. Um, there are a huge number of examples if you want to use it. All these examples are, are also run as tests because Go lets you do that and like actual integration tests. Like you want to quick query something with a child. It also supports um, like mutations. I didn't even go into that, but you can actually. Uh, create multiple things in your database and in the same query you can insert, you can update, you can have, you know, where statements or, you know, whatever. So, um, and yeah, it's, it's uh, the whole standalone service is also a library. So if you want to use it as ORM, you can, or if you want to embed the whole service within your own application, that's, um, that's, uh, that's in there too. It's called the two packages, primarily core is the compiler, serve is the, um, serve is the, the whole service that you can also embed in your application. Vasm, I'm experimenting with compiling into Vasm. I'm, uh, it's apparently really easy with Go and I've had some success. I want to be able to run this in like, you know, Node or some other environments as well. Um, okay, so let me see uh, some of the questions. Uh, can you showcase so various tables? Uh, showcase how you associate various tables. So the table association. Uh, so Abhishek is asking uh, how the the various table. You know how we create associations between the GraphQL and the tables. That's all internal. So what happens is there's a discovery step. So when Grafton starts up, actually interrogates your database. It figures all your tables, all the relationships, all the functions, all the columns, everything, and it internally builds like a graph. And then uses that to when it's doing joins and stuff, it walks the, the edges and it has different weights. So it says this, this join is more efficient than that one. Um, so it, it's all internal. I, there's no way to see that. Uh, but essentially all the tables on, you know, in that schema or whatever are pulled in. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, but it works right now with MySQL and, and Postgres and I'm looking to, you know, expand that. Uh, how do you map the GraphQL query to SQL at DB level? Any DS? No. So the uh, GraphQL folks will be very familiar with the schema, right? You have to define a schema. Here, there is no schema. You just query your database anyhow you like. You just uh, start, you know, it's all, already knows everything about your database. So you can just start writing your queries out of the box. Um, such a common problem, wonderful solution, uh, thing manage roles. So roles, there you can read the documentation. I, we have two, we have uh, this thing called a roles query that you can actually define. So what happens is, it, it, and it would have your user ID in it. So you can actually, this query would get executed before the main query and figure out the role for the user. 
and then you have a uh, role based access control so you can basically have your query behave differently for different roles uh, or you can pass a role in part of a jwt token or whatever it could take it from there as well um so let me see what the other thing is uh, um, do you manage roles or perms using graphql um, uh, yes so you know i, I i'm not going to the the permissions and role uh, access control stuff is a little more complicated and uh, more advanced i think and you know the, I wouldn't be able to explain it properly just in this uh, this call. Uh, caching, I don't do any caching, but I let you set cache headers. So you know, GraphQL works in two modes. Either you can have this mode where it's post only, where it uses post requests so it cannot be cached, or you can do something called uh, APQ, uh, automated persistent queries, where it uses get requests and doesn't even send the GraphQL back, just sends like a hash back, and is really efficient. These lightweight requests, so. Get can be cached, so you can set cache headers. It's it's uh, you know I, I want to build some kind of caching, but caching is a really strange and hard problem. Like you know, GraphGen is designed to be deployed into like these serverless environments where you want scale to zero or scale out to hundred, where stateless. So you know when you have requests going to one of hundred servers or thousand servers, I mean you know it's not easy to invalidate if you're you know someone's using updating a like over there and this one is you know yes we could use Redis and all that and. Um, I, I think it's not hard to build. Also, you could use GraphGen as a library and build that yourself. If you want. Um, or uh, for instance, ORMs, I've seen conflict update, uh, not, so we do support all of that. So, you know, conflict updates, you can, uh, it, it does several things. So uh, how about tables spanning across the different DBs? So no, we do not support more than one database right now. Uh, Again, if you have several databases, I would be like, you know, why do you have that? And uh, essentially you could run, you could run two graph gens, maybe so do some graph federation, you know, like there are graph, GraphQL services out there, several in Go that can like federate two GraphQL servers and stuff. Uh, I'm not sure. And uh, I'm working on ability to have these read replicas and, you know, talk to multiple databases, but still with the same schema, not, um, GraphGen itself can be used as a, you know what, you could build it in your own API. You could instantiate two GraphGen instances, each one talking to a different API, and then, you know, just munch the J JSON back yourself. Maybe, yeah. Uh, same problem in our company and uh, solve this currently on Java stack if there's similar implementation. So I'm not aware of any. I have got, have had a lot of people asking me about the same thing in Java. Um, I don't know. I do, I know that Go can talk to Java, and I I want to do this. I want to make this library available in other. Um, in so part of my Wasm work, compiled to Wasm work, was to make it available to say Node.js or whatever. Um, essentially, I would say you know just run another service. It's very lightweight. The, you know the Docker image or whatever is like tiny. Um, yeah, I, and maybe just you know have a have a different host name or something. Yeah. Have the cookie. Go the well. So, uh, so uh, to hey, uh, whoever is not on mute, could you go on mute? Uh, I'm mute in the meantime. You create a REST service on top of the GraphGen so processes the request. No, yeah, exactly. You can build a, a REST service here. So, like here, if you look at core, right? It is just like essentially you can use it like an ORM. So this code could be instantiated once as a global or whatever. And then you just issue these queries within your handler and you'll get JSON back. Now you can, you know, JSON and marshal it yourself and do something with it or just return it back if you want it. Um, okay, wait, can't, can't we create a REST service on top of this and uh, draft in processor request? Yeah, absolutely. You can have, make, you know, have a proxy ahead of it. Yeah, why not? Um, you know, it's it's after all just you know an HTTP endpoint. So, uh, yeah, there you know, I, there there are a lot of features. There's documentation. I've uh, there are some other videos out there where I've presented it in a couple places, and it it works. It serves um, you know requests for my uh, startup forty two papers. It's really fast, and this is you know for example uh, the infinite scroll working in place, and so. Um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if I can inspect some of this and show you the network traffic or uh, 
it's not Hmm. It was... There, so that's a request. So, for example, you can potentially see it's uh, it's it's using these get requests using what I called was uh, you know what I called APQ, and uh, that's the response. Uh, you'll see it's like fetching all the data. It has a cursor to the you know next set of requests. You know each paper. It's and this is all done by like a single query. So, um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you for, you know, uh, listening. Hey, Vikram, if anyone has any like... questions, please, you know, feel free to get on audio. Yeah, so am I audible? You are, yeah. Cool. So I was curious about, like, could you sort of share a bit more context on uh, let's say like with respect to implementation, right? Uh, when mm -hmm. we do select query with GraphQL uh, in your library, how do you sort of convert this to uh, SQL query, like defining fields and then yeah. how do you uh, build that? Uh, yeah. Let's say if I am go, going to, let's say focus, like build something similar, right? Like that's the yeah. correct, right? So could you no, share no, absolutely. more on that? That's, uh, that's a great question. You know, that's uh, in fact, like, yeah, best question. I love answering that. So let me just tell you maybe how I started even on day one, right? I mean, I was like, okay, how do I build a compiler in Go? So I looked around and the best place to, uh, and I guess, can you guess which is the best place to see code for that? Go itself, right? Go is a compiler, it's written in Go. So I looked around, there were some talks out there by you know some of the team, Go team, and they talked about this uh, parser that they have, you know, how they build their parser. So I started to look at that and essentially copied some of those pieces and some of those ideas around, how um, uh, how they tokenized, uh, you know, every compiler has multiple steps, you know, just, you know like any compiler class, it's a standard stuff, you know, you parse, uh, you tokenize, then, you, you know, you then build the ASTs from the, you know, from the tokens, and then you have the, the, the abstract syntax trees, then you walk those trees and do whatever you want. So uh, essentially, I, you know, tokenize the GraphQL, then I, you know, build a parser that, that walked the token list and then figured out what it was expecting and built out the abstract syntax tree. And those abstract syntax trees were converted in, you know, there was more information tucked into every node of it saying, oh, this is, and because we had already queried the database, I have all this information. So as I'm walking, I'm like, okay, this looks like should be a column or this should be a table name. And then let me fetch that table. Let me figure out what's that, let me tag that, you know, that node with that extra information. So that way all this, you know, and then once I have this rich tree, then there's another step where it's, um, it's walked and then you create this like structure, which I call a Q code, which is essentially, you know, what, it's like this middle representation, which I need to build SQL, uh, but technically I could use that to write, you know, something else in the future, not SQL, maybe some other dialect for something else. And uh, then finally that, you know, there is the, the rendering step, which takes that Q code abstraction and writes out uh, the SQL. And um, in the meanwhile, when it's like, it's, uh, the Q code is also has information like the joins and stuff. So it's saying, okay, if there is this parent and this child, then, then it makes a query to this graph you know, in memory and says, okay, can you give me the best path for this? And, and based on a bunch of heuristics plus, you know, some knowledge, for example, if it's like, uh, you, like the array columns in Postgres, you cannot join, the, you cannot use them as foreign keys, but with GraphChain, you can. You can essentially join with an array column and say you have like an array column with, um, I don't know, say category IDs in there, and you want to join it against the category state, you can. It's not the most efficient join. So, so essentially, if you don't need that join to happen, then you know the graph would say, okay, this is a, this is a heavier join. You know, you decide kind of thing. And uh, so at that step, you know, I have a lot of that information, and then the SQL renderer stuff goes in, and that, uh, and they're all different packages. So I've, uh, uh, you know, one other thing I've done is I try to make it readable by splitting it out into different packages, trying to document as much as possible. Have a lot of tests in all the packages, so um, so yeah, that's um, yeah, that's that's how you go about building something. Like this. Uh, could you share which package is under uh, Graph? So, so that way, like we can go and read. Oh, absolutely. Those. So if so, if you go into say, so Core is the main compiler, and Serve is like the service that uses Core. So it is like you all know, the HTTP and all that stuff on top. And so if you're interested in Core, the compiler, then you go in here, mm -hmm. and um, this is basically the main. Uh, part of it, but the, the, all the packages, different ones are under internal. 
So there is a PSQL that is the one that actually writes out the SQL. Uh, there is, a, you know, for example, this is uh, it understands, you know, it writes out SQL for different things like, you know, each MySQL, Postgres, all of that. Um, like there is graph, which is, I think, just a graph implementation or something. Uh, there's a Q code. This is the, the mid, middle representation. Um, for example, this is a Q code data structure. It has, you know, various types and, you know, arguments. And uh, so these are selects like GraphQL each. Each node of the tree is a select in GraphQL. Like if you, you know, say a user, and then you say, I want these fields of the user. That's the entire thing is a select. So you'll see some other information. You'll see like columns, you know, the these are base columns, these are columns and not to be exposed, but I need for joining and stuff. Um, you know, like if there are any functions related, are there any grouping that happens? Is there an order by? Is there, you know, some kind of page paging that's happening, pagination, you know. Should I skip rendering this for some reason? You know, the joins that are, then I decide these are the joins I need to, you know, combine this guy with his parent. And then that joins are under here. So this is like like the core structure. I think the whole thing works around. And this is what comes out of the, you know, the AST, and then you know, the, the renderer picks this up and and you know kind of understands how to render that out. Um, the the JSON. Um, let me just go back in my thing. So. The, G, the JSON uh, conversion actually happens in Postgres. So Postgres is very good capable. I don't know if this is, if I can, okay, I guess it's not clear enough. But uh, the JSON conversion happens in Postgres, like Postgres can build JSON objects and it's got very efficient C code to do that. So, yeah. Uh, okay, how do you make sure that the generated SQL would be performing? Well, I mean, for one, uh, when it's discovering the database, it requires you to have relationships defined. So you have to use foreign keys. You, you know, you have to have those indexes. And when it's making those joins and stuff, it's not going to join something. There's no index. It'll tell you that, you know, this is not something I can do. Or it'll just not have that relationship between the two. You will just not be able to, uh, you know, let's say that not found here. And uh, essentially, it, it knows that there are those indexes. That's why it lets you write that GraphQL. And... Um, you can define your uh, foreign keys uh, in the config too, but in Postgres, I mean, you know, in um, you, you can you, you can actually just go in and define them. But um, I don't mean in the database, but in the config. So, but at that point, then it does not have all the information about uh, about the you know. So so it's it's like it doesn't know how efficient some of those joins will be in that case. But essentially, if you are saying user and give me products, it's going to do that for you if you define the join. Now, there isn't any more efficient way to do that. You know, if you don't have an index and you are essentially, but if you have an index, it's, it's going to be able to do that for you. And, uh, and at the end of the day, you can, uh, yeah, you can see what the performance is of your query because you know it does give you that information in the logs if you switch on debug mode and stuff it'll tell you that you know this query took this much time plus it's got um, ability for you to add in like uh, open zip you know one of these like open trace and uh, integrate with these tracing libraries out there there's several now and so it will report you know performance and stuff back to um, i think open telemetry i think that's what it's called Yeah, MySQL uh, 8 plus also gives back JSON. The thing about MySQL is um, there's no mutation. So because um, GraphGen right now uses a lot of like Postgres capabilities to let you uh, create, insert multiple things at the same time, like you can create a blog post and the user who created the blog post at the same time. And maybe like three comments, like three different tables. It, use, it builds, it generates one single SQL query to do you know all of those inserts and updates. And that is not possible in MySQL. There are lots of bugs and stuff that cause it to. But uh, for querying, it's, uh, you know, all the tests right now are basically when you do, when I do make tests, it uses this uh, Go library called uh, Genome Mock. So essentially, it's an interesting library that uh, launch controls Docker in the background. And it starts up Postgres and everything, and it runs and MySQL, and it runs like a whole series of tests against both. Um, and those tests are the same things you same code examples that you see so uh, you know essentially it's you know fully compatible in terms of query uh, feature for feature with both but mutations are not supported by uh, and you can even use subscriptions and stuff but you cannot use updates and then 
So, but if you're using it as a library, you can always build out those APIs yourself. Uh, if there are no more questions, then I'll um, I'll hand this back. Thanks. Uh, cool. That, that's thanks for on and uh, Vikram. Like both are like pretty core talks. I think like like we didn't talk about let's say hey building an API or how do we write uh, syntax level code. I think that's all we can do on our own. But like if we sort of try to understand like both of your projects, like we'll get to know uh, really a lot of like lot on the Go aspects, right? Like it's if somebody is totally new to Go, I would suggest like, hey, uh, you can start writing an API server, but like for everyone of uh, everyone who have been uh, like sort of playing around with Go uh, or doing prod systems, like I think it's pretty good projects to read upon and then try to understand uh, much more core levels. And it's not just a simple CRUD straight. So, it was very, very uh, helpful, uh, useful talk. I think at least I'm sort of curious on like how it happens underneath. Uh, would love to have you both on like under the session to walk us through code or talk in terms of code or issues faced and then things like that. Uh, that would definitely be a like a really uh, good session. Uh, this is a good high level overview with with some info. Uh, I, I would love I, to have yeah, that. I, uh, I just have one thing to uh, kind of you know interject there. I'd say that uh, you know people if they're new to Go or something, I'd say that Go. One thing I realized is you can be really ambitious with Go. There are no trade-offs. Many languages you always like. Okay, this is good for webs, but not for this. It's good for that, but not for this. There are no trade-offs with Go. Literally, you can have heavy compute happening. You can do you know lightweight database stuff. You can do anything. Then build you know Kafka again. Probably be more performant. Um, and additionally, the language is, doesn't have all the header files and all this other boilerplate that will waste your time. So, and the tests and everything are so easy to write that you can really build ambitious things. Like one or two people can build like, you know, entire data infrastructure things and they'll work beautifully. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. I think like, it's, it's like you can take big libraries and then sort of rewrite it. Like, I think now there is another way, right? Like I see people, uh, using Rust to uh, rewrite the libraries because they want it to be much more performant uh, because of no GC. But I think like, yeah, definitely. It, it's not just like, I, I think to be frank, I think most of us, like like at least for myself, like I think what we do at work is like crud. It all boils down to, uh, but like doing something concrete, like, like beyond like using hard data structures and then all of that is like super cool. So, and, and then that too, I think like you folks have done it out of your uh, job or after boundary. So thanks for uh, doing this talk. I, I would let the floor open again. Like I, I, I guess like I can sort of talk two minutes and then leave it open. So, so that way we can discuss anything. Like it doesn't have to be specific to the talk or you can shoot questions uh, in general or, or we can also share other things. So yeah, bef before doing that, like, like just closing out uh, again for folks who join late, uh, join the meetup, uh, go Bangalore. Uh, like we are, uh, we conduct monthly events. Um, and I'm, I'm strongly like, like looking for any co-organizers or volunteers because, um, I, I think from further month, like it'll be difficult for me to also run the meet because I'll be relocating to a different time zone as well. So anybody who is interested in volunteering or anyone who wants to co-organize, uh, like, like these to reach out to me. And the other important factor is like, uh, whatever you've seen today is like super cool. But I think if you have done like even a small playing around, or if you have learned something which you think is useful, uh, do reach out to me and then like we can schedule a talk for the, uh, for the meets. Uh, like you don't need to worry that, hey, this is not useful, but like assume that, hey, a lot of folks have not written Go. Uh, so please do sign up uh, with like looking forward to uh, hearing what you were doing in production level systems. So um, do reach out to me for uh, like, like signing up for further talks. Uh, and also like, like we'll post this in YouTube. Uh, like, like you can check the other videos over there. Uh, if there is any feedbacks for speakers or myself for the meet, uh, given that we are doing remote, uh, do DM us. Like, like you can DM me on Twitter or you can share uh, in Gopher Slacks also. 
So give feedbacks because that'll be more helpful to the speakers for uh, further talks as well. Um, so having said that, yeah, thanks again, any, everyone for joining. Uh, I'm Dinesh, like, like you can also reach out to me anytime my DMs are open. Um, would love to sort of have a discussion on infra or meetup or go any of that context wherever I could help. Uh, having said that, I'll, I'll stop the recording. I'll leave the floor open. Uh, we can network, uh, we can discuss in general about Go or even other software uh, practices. So thanks again.